Thank you very much for this opportunity to present a little bit about e-services, inclusive and equitable pub public services. And I will use Sweden as a case during my presentation. Uh, and uh, the agenda for the presentation is I will start to give a short introduction to Sweden and uh, just briefly mention Stockholm University. I think, I strongly believe that public administration and how we design uh, uh, digital services and e-government solutions is very much dependent on the context, uh, on the uh, the special characteristics of the country where it's developed. So I think Sweden is important as a backdrop to what I'm saying here. Uh, then I will talk about equitable and inclusive public services. I will give, start by giving you a few examples and then I will discuss a few topics in relation to this e-service maturity, which you probably are familiar with, single point of contact, a little bit about citizen mailboxes and digital archives, just mentioned that, open data and service ecosystems, automation, and then also about Sweden's public strategy for e-government and digitalization, as well as weaknesses and uh, um, challenges that we have. Then we will have a question and answering uh, uh, session. And I will end by summarizing and wrapping, wrapping up what I said and, and the questions that you have had. Yeah. And I'm, if you feel like typing a question in the chat, don't hesitate to do that during the presentation. I might answer it directly or I will keep it till the question and answering session, depending on what the question is. <clears throat> so, just starting to point out where Sweden is located. Uh, it's up here in the northeast of this map. Here we have Thailand. In the map, it looks like Sweden is much bigger than Thailand, but it's not like that. It's just a strange map. Yeah, <clears throat> we have the same fundamental government system. Uh, Thailand is slightly bigger than Sweden, and you have a much larger population than Sweden. Um, uh, we have a GDP, which is about one third of your GDP. Uh, but we have managed to, to develop e-government in a fairly successful way, so far anyway while Thailand is still lagging a little bit, at least when we look at the uh, United Nations survey of this year. So we, Sweden was the top uh, country in the world in 2008 when these surveys I think. <laughs> So a little look at the uh, Swedish government structure. Um, we have a national government. We have regional governments, 21 of them. And we have 290 municipalities or local governments. <coughs> Regional government and local government are on the same government level, but they uh, are responsible for different things. So the regions are responsible for healthcare, dental care for, for uh, up to young adults and public transport, while local government is, uh, has a fairly larger responsibility in terms of schools, social services, elderly care, <clears throat> but also urban planning and emergency services and sanitation. 
if we look at the public budget, uh, the national budget is about $130 billion. Regional budget, about 44. Local budget, about 82 billion. And that means that about 45% <clears throat> of the Swedish GDP um, are paid in taxes and used as public uh, funding. And then, of course, Sweden is part of the European Union. And uh, so a portion of our taxes and public budgets goes to the European Union. And uh, <clears throat> the goal of the European Union is to have a single market for, for trade, but also for employment. And so a Swede can work in, in France, for example, and a, a, a French citizen can work in Sweden. Yeah. A few things about the Swedish context. Yeah, Sweden together with other Nordic countries, and that is Denmark, um, Finland, Norway, but also the Netherlands, they are characterized by a fairly high equity among citizens and a high efficiency in public administration. Uh, which is, I think, a significant uh, characteristic of uh, our government. But Sweden is also characterized by a high degree of decentralization. <clears throat> and we, can, we will see later on that this is uh, a little bit cumbersome when it comes to e-government implementation. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> But this means that um, uh, the local governments and the regions, they have a big responsibility for e-government development in each of their uh, areas. Uh, so it means basically that the local e-government solution has to be developed 290 times. Uh, and uh, the sharing of standards and so forth is not as high as you would like it to be. <clears throat> Sweden is also characterized by a comparatively high level of trust in public institutions. Um, you can see the black bar in the middle, it's the average of trust among OECD countries or EU countries, while Sweden, Norway, Denmark, Finland, and also um, uh, Czechoslovakia puts much, much higher trust in government, uh, which means um, that um, uh, they can do things and we trust that they do the right thing uh, when they invest, for example, in e-government. We also have one thing that maybe stands out a little bit, and that is the, the, um, the public transparency which is uh, constituted in law and it's supposedly to be one of the first <clears throat> transparency acts in the world from 1766 and it means that everybody has access to official documents all the officials in government they also have the freedom to express their view uh, even if it's uh, different from the view of the head of the administration. Also, public officials have the right to communicate and publish information, for example, in newspapers or in, in uh, TV. Uh, everybody has access to all court hearings. They are public. And also decision-making meetings uh, like the parliament in, in Sweden. <clears throat> This is a picture of Stockholm, the capital of, of Sweden. And you can see here in the middle, the Royal Palace. It's very small compared to the Royal Palace in Bangkok, for example. Here we have a parliament, uh, the assembly building. And here is the city hall of uh, Stockholm. 
The Stockholm University is located outside the city center of uh, uh, Stockholm. It was founded uh, almost 150 years ago. We have 33,000 students and 5,600 employees, <coughs> which makes us uh, the largest university in Sweden. Um, depending on which world ranking you look at, we are among the top 100 or top 200 universities in the world. And uh, as uh, Professor Piracic said, and uh, where he and his colleague, colleagues visited us was uh, at the Department of Computer and System Sciences and at our eGov lab which is our lab for e-government development, e-government solutions. And we're located not at the main campus of Stockholm University, but it, in a suburb to Stockholm, where we have a lot of IT companies. I belong to the unit of information systems. And uh, as uh, Professor Piracic said, uh, my focus is on e-government and digital innovation, as well as enterprise systems. <clears throat> so let's move on to focus on equitable and uh, incl inclusive public services. I will just start my timer here so I don't spend too much time on this. Yeah. I will give you a few examples of Swedish e-services. <clears throat> I will touch upon e-service maturity as a concept, single point of contact, which seems to be a very, very important part of an e-government strategy. I will also talk a little bit about the concept of life events, uh, touch upon the the digital flow and the importance of citizen mailboxes and digital archives <clears throat> in order to not break this flow. I will also talk about some recent development regarding open data and service ecosystems, automation, <coughs> and then weaknesses in Sweden's digitalization. And now we start with some examples of Swedish e-services. We will have this as a backdrop when we discuss later on. <clears throat> yeah, I'm afraid this is the first lecture I have uh, during this semester and I, I usually uh, get a little bit rusty. And that's why I am coughing here. <clears throat> I will present to you uh, three examples. File for tax return, which is a national e-service that we use once a year. But also a regional service where I can check my health records, I can check my prescriptions, uh, test results and so forth, and book <coughs> doctor appointments. And I will also show you a local e-service for selecting schools for children. Now my children are grown-ups, but I have a record from 2013, which <clears throat> is still there and you will see it. And the citizen X in this case is me. Yeah. Core to all e-services in Sweden is an electronic ID. And uh, uh, the so-called bank ID has become the, uh, uh, the common solution that, that people tend to use. <clears throat> so I will start with this. Uh, so basically the, e, the bank ID uh, is uh, uh, a service uh, that you uh, have installed as an app on your mobile phone and through that app you can uh, identify yourself in both commercial and uh, 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 public services. <clears throat> as the name uh, says, it started out as an electronic ID for, for the Swedish banks, uh, but it quickly um, emerged as the electronic ID used by common people. So. 
if we look at how much um, of the Swedish citizens that work uh, that use bank ID, uh, we can see that it's close to 100%. <clears throat> the green bars are uh, smartphone users, so there is almost 100% smartphone users in most age categories, and more or less every one of these users use um, um, bank ideas. Um, and you can see, um, uh, however, at the older ages, you can see, for example, 76 years and above, you can see we only have 60% bank ID or smartphone users and only 20% bank ID users. So <clears throat> it seems like the bank ID itself is uh, a hinder, uh, a barrier for elderly people. Um, and it hinders them also from using uh, some of the e-services here. <clears throat> so some drawbacks with the bank ID, there have been some frauds, uh, there have been some security issues, uh, and uh, it has so far been manageable, both from the police and from the banks, <clears throat> but elderly people are a little bit skeptical of actually using it and using it, carrying it around on their phones. Uh, they're afraid of being robbed or, or uh, the like. So let's move on to uh, one of the national e-services issued by the national government and the uh, uh, national tax agency. So taxes in Sweden, as you saw, there are about 250 billion US dollars in taxes collected every year. And uh, they are collected uh, collectively for all levels of government. So we don't pay um, taxes to local government, to regional government specifically. It's all collected on one level and then redistributed. And uh, when we look at uh, uh, the number of people who actually used the e-service, uh, there is also uh, the option to, to file for tax return using uh, paper forms. But 80% did so digitally this year. We uh, filed for tax return in May every year and 4 million used the e-service, which looks like this. <clears throat> and you just uh, control all, um, it's very difficult to see here, but basically the process is that the tax agency in advance uh, collects all um, data about your income and the preliminary taxes that you have paid throughout the year. Uh, and then uh, um, <clears throat> yeah, they do all sorts of deductions and, and things that you have the right to do depending on who you are. And then uh, you check these figures and you adjust, and then you sign the form, the digital form, and then you submit it. And in the same process, um, they calculate your final taxes. So for example, this year, uh, I have to pay uh, a few extra dollars uh, because I had more income than they thought that I would have. Yeah, one and a half million use the mobile service, which you could see here behind. It looks similar to this one, but in a mobile format, of course. Half a million use the buttons on their telephone, <clears throat> and half a million used SMS. And uh, when uh, this service appeared, it started out as an SMS service, and then they built the service, the mobile service and uh, kept the SMS and the telephone service as options. <clears throat> so let's move on to the second example service here. Uh, and that is uh, a regional service where we check, uh, where I can go in and check my health record. And I can also book a doctor. 
So here you can see it's in Swedish. It's called 1177, the service. Here is me. I have logged in to my account in the same fashion as I did to the um, tax authorities uh, service. I check journal services. We call it journal in Sweden and not health record, but in English it's health record. And here I can see what the doctor has written from our last appointments and my prescriptions of uh, medication. Test results, for example, I made a test for COVID-19 um, two months ago, and the answer is here. It was negative. <coughs> so this is a regional service, and uh, it's pretty complex. It collects data from all 21 regions here in Sweden. So irrespective of where I had my uh, doctor's appointment, it will collect all the, the medical records. It will collect uh, um, all the, the test answers and so forth. And let's move on to the third uh, service here. I uh, wanted to show you. It's a local service where I can select schools for my children if I have any. So I live in a municipality, one of the 290 Swedish municipalities east of Stockholm called Nacka. It's a suburb. It's about 15 minutes from the center of Stockholm. Here again, I have my page. So I have logged in using my bank ID. You can see my, uh, my name here. So this is... Uh, where I communicate with my municipality. Uh, and uh, here, for example, I can choose schools. When I do that, uh, I uh, <clears throat> get a list of schools. And here I can select, uh, uh, I think it's up to three options, uh, and then uh, uh, apply for my kid to that school. And I have an old record here in my pages for my youngest daughter, who's seven years old now, but it was when she was going to start <coughs> in grade seven. And she was here, we can see the status. She was placed in this school called Skubri. Um, so these were some examples um, filed for tax return. A national service, check health record and book doctor, a regional service, and select schools for children, a local service. <clears throat> yeah. And when we talk about equitable and inclusive publics, um, what kind of characteristics kind of requirements could you place on such services? And I think this is, <clears throat> of course, a much uh, bigger debate than I will be able to cover in this presentation. But um, I wrote this paper a few years ago uh, where we looked at um, four uh, important aspects of this type of service. A democracy aspect, a service aspect, a professionalism aspect, uh, and an administrative aspect. And from a democratic perspective, what can you expect? Well, uh, as you can see, uh, all these services include some kind of interaction. <clears throat> I have some influence over and also responsibility, of course, for my own situation. So I interact with the government at the different levels. Um, <clears throat> also, the service should provide le legal security for me and equal treatment. Even if I don't make as much money as my neighbor, I should be treated in the same fashion. And I think that is one of the key things with public e-services that uh, each citizen is treated in an equal manner. 
but also transparency in government decision making. I can go back and check the grounds for for a decision made by government, and I have the right to appeal if I don't like the result. And there is uh, in all these uh, <clears throat> in all these three examples there are uh, buttons I can use in order to appeal. Uh, from a citizen perspective, um, e-government has meant that uh, public services are usually available 24-7. This is not true for the tax, uh, tax agency services. They are only open between 6 o'clock in the morning and 2200 hours in the evening or something because they do batch jobs when they process the data, which means that they cannot be open during a period of time and they have decided to shut them down during night. Um, it's also um, for the tax agency to be able to answer question if something goes wrong in the service um, so they always have to have people available and monitoring uh, the operation of the services. Uh, the next bullet here, service content easy to understand. And that I think is fundamental for the inclusiveness here. <clears throat> we have uh, a few minority languages, which all these services should uh, be able to uh, to handle, um, and there could be other special needs if you have, for example, if you have a hearing deficit or, uh, or so. And also from uh, the perspective of the user, uh, cut lead times, short lead times, uh, which makes that you get an instant, it provides an instant response to your interaction with government. From the other side of the table then, um, <clears throat> from the officials, the public uh, administrators and officials side, um, that cases are treated equally and uh, simple cases automated if possible. And we will look at that a little bit later on, <clears throat> uh, which means that official can focus on complex cases where they are needed the most it makes the best use of resources, of human resources. And uh, um, you can see traces of this from the administrative perspective as well. Efficiency is important. And in order to get efficiency in public e-services, you need to integrate between different agencies, both vertically and horizontally. And we will get back to what this means later on here. But also digital archiving, it seems to be a great barrier to really create full efficiency in public e-services. It's a slow process, at least in Sweden. So let's move on to e-service maturity. Now, this is a very old model by Lane and Lee published 20 years ago now, but it kind of constituted the first idea of how e-services develop and what makes a complex service and what makes a simple service. And we go from <clears throat> very simple uh, technical solution with very low level or sparse integration when we talk about catalog services. And those are basically information services where you can read something about uh, a service uh, provided by a public organization. The next level is transaction, and basically forms available online, um, and uh, uh, databases supporting online transactions. Vertical integration then, then uh, it means that local systems are linked to higher level systems. <clears throat> uh, but uh, you, you keep the functionality quite narrow. So you have a similar functionality. 
then you have horizontal integration where systems are integrated across different functions uh, among different uh, 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 public agencies and so forth. And support for one-stop shopping for citizens. <laughs> this ladder of maturity has been criticized because it's very two-dimensional. And uh, <clears throat> public digital government can develop along different uh, axes here. And it could look a little bit different in different countries, in different agencies, in different uh, uh, municipalities, depending on the context. Uh, so um, it has been criticized for not reflecting reality so good. But if we use this as a template and look at the three examples I had, uh, and look at the level of maturity for the three examples. Uh, the file for, facts, uh, for tax return is definitely a case of horizontal integration, where you collect data from a number of different systems and agencies uh, before you put together an individual person's <coughs> uh, total tax record. The other two are examples of vertical integration where maybe the regional service is more complex than the local service. I don't know really. The local service is integrated with different school systems. <coughs> so it might be as complex as the regional service, but they are both examples of vertical integration. It's more than transaction systems. They also uh, in uh, integrate different systems over different domains in a useful way for me as a user. Which leads us on to the next point here, which is single point of contact. And uh, this has been a, a big um, drive among local governments in Sweden over the last five years to strive for a single point of contact. And why is that so? Well, if you remember from one of my earlier slides, I showed you the uh, responsibility of local government in Sweden. You have schools at different levels. You have social services, you have elderly care, you have urban planning, all these different areas uh, are usually organized in one uh, separate administration each. A little bit depending on the size of the municipality, um, the, the, Stop, the city of Stockholm, which uh, has uh, uh, many uh, inhabitants, they have several uh, separate administrations while smaller municipalities with maybe 15,000, 20,000 inhabitants, they might have fewer uh, administrations. And each of these administrations, they traditionally, they have separate organizations. And usually they have their own service desk or contact point. So in a small municipality with say, six separate administrations, you will have six different contact points, depending on the type of case that you are uh, handling. <clears throat> but many Swedish local governments move towards a single point of contact for all administrations. So you as a citizen, citizen you don't have to bother where to contact the municipality. You just go straight up to the service desk or you use the e-services that are available uh, from one point. And this has pretty big implications, both for citizens, it becomes more convenient, hopefully, but also the organization of the government. And uh, also very important, the technical architecture behind this. <clears throat> Uh, and just let me give you um, a brief um, illustration of this. 
uh, to the left here, uh, you see right now, um, one smaller municipality in, uh, in uh, uh, northern of Stockholm <coughs> called Lexan. And it has six different administrations. And you can see that you have, uh, you have to choose when you come as a citizen because they have six different uh, entry points here. And here we have Skellefteå, uh, which is slightly bigger, but further north in Sweden. And they only have one point of contact here. Uh, and uh, it's open 24 hours uh, per day. And what does that, what does this mean? Well, uh, if we provide a schematic here, it means that instead of you, as a client or a citizen. <clears throat> um, uh, to the left here, you have the traditional architecture where you have to have contacts with each single department or each single organization. While on the right hand side, where you have um, a layer on top of each of the organizations, uh, a point of contact, a service desk, or in this case, they call it service orchestrator, with some data about you, you only yeah, stay in contact with this service orchestrator and they orchestrate the integration with the different uh, organization on the back here. Uh, so a traditional architecture where each administration have developed their own systems. You typically have a front office, you have local databases, and you have a back office for each administration. And in a single municipality, you would have five to 10 of these uh, <clears throat> separate uh, admins. It's not citizen centric. I have to contact each of them uh, independently. And uh, it's also, it creates barriers between the administrations internally. So it's usually quite difficult for them to cooperate. Uh, internally. If you move from this uh, uh, traditional architecture towards a single point of contact, uh, it might look a little bit more like this. So you have uh, front office layers where you uh, use your identify yourself in the digital authentication you can access through multiple channels, e-services, SMS, mobile services, telephone, or physical contact. <clears throat> and you have a seamless interface. So you have access to all the services irrespective of which administration that actually is responsible for that specific service. I know uh, from the case of Skellefteå that they have identified 2,300 types of cases in, uh, um, in their day-to-day -day, uh, operation. And for each of these cases, they have assigned three people responsible for handling them. And uh, if you have a good system support, it, this is not the problem, um, but... Um, in a traditional way, it would have been handled by each separate administration. Here we also have back office layers connecting the back office systems of the different administration. So we have a corporation infrastructure, we have global databases, uh, and we have a connectivity infrastructure. So um, this municipality also can uh, integrate technically with other agencies, for example, the tax agency, uh, the police, or whatever. Uh, so this back office layer uh, supports collaboration within and between agencies. <clears throat> uh, on an EU level, uh, we have the single digital gateway as a strategic initiative. Um, and uh, it, it's an example of um, a single point of contact on a super national level. 
and uh, you have the link there if you're interested. So what are the implications of single point of contact? Well, the advantages is we get a citizen-centric um, solution, which is good uh, for inclusion and equity. We get a faster response time. We get central control over all cases. And this is uh, something that is, um, when a municipality moves towards this, this is something that they will realize it makes it very easy for them to prioritize resources. Uh, and um, so it becomes a foundation for continuous improvement, uh, which is a very good way uh, to learn and to develop and to evaluate. For example, they found out that uh, <clears throat> one of the top contacts with the municipality was to know the opening hours for the city dump. And uh, so they um, created a very, very simple mobile service um, uh, to inform about this. Uh, and then they, uh, more or less overnight, um, they uh, reduced the contacts with 10%. Yeah, uh, challenges. Uh, it's a challenge to establish a multi-channel service desk with competent staff. You have to pick people from each of the separate administrations in order to create a good service desk. And it also means that you need to rebalance the responsibility between the service desk staff and the administrative staff. And this means a shift in power among middle management and it leads to resistance and you need to work actively with this resistance to overcome it. At least that is the experience from Sweden. Talking about moving government closer to the citizen. Well, uh, there is this uh, concept of life events that appeared about 10, 15 years ago. Uh, and what is it? A life event is really when you look um, at something that makes sense in a person's life, for example, becoming a parent or start a business, then you organize all the public services around this life event. Um, <clears throat> so it means that I, as a citizen, when I face a certain event in my life, uh, for example, getting my first job or um, yeah, when I become a parent, I need to have contact with different agencies, with the municipality and, and some different agencies. Uh, and if we create a service, a public service, for uh, this life event, it will become much easier for me as a citizen uh, in order to navigate through all these different contacts that I need to have. And from my perspective, the ideal, the vision here is that I should only experience it as one contact while it in reality is a number of different transactions with different agencies. Yeah, this is uh, a um, um, survey made by the French government uh, under President Sarkozy. Uh, this is a citizen perspective. I will not go into details here about all the different life events they define, but they define thousands of them. The size of the bubble it indicates also the importance. And here we have a number of users. A lot of people have to pay taxes. Uh, and here we have the complexity of the services. Uh, these are the three examples I brought up. We have provide my children with schooling. Uh, I take care of my health and I pay my tax. Here is a business perspective from the same survey. And one of these life events is starting a business. It's 
it usually involves a lot of contact with public agencies. You have to get permits uh, to set up, for example, uh, a store somewhere. You need to get permits to treat food. Um, you need to get a permit to employ people. Uh, you need to establish the firm itself and so forth and so forth. A number of agencies, a number of contacts. Uh, so let's have a look at the, uh, the Swedish solution to this. Um, I think this is one of the few examples where Swedish public administration have made an attempt to create uh, a service around a life event. Yeah, as I told you, when you start a business, you usually have contacts with a number of agencies and it could be overwhelming and take a lot of time. For example, if you would start a truck business, a logistical business, you, you would have contact with six different uh, agencies in Sweden. And it usually took six to 12 months to get your permit. Uh, they created a specific service for this type of business. Uh, and uh, it, they moved, uh, they shortened the lead time to a few days instead. Uh, in this, uh, the overarching service for this is called Verksam.se or um, yeah, it's government services to, for businesses. And here you can start a business within a few minutes. And I did so when I started my own business um, 10 years ago. I registered a company and during a single uh, subway trip, I got the confirmation uh, that the business was accepted and up and running. There are some challenges with life events. Life consists of thousands of life events. Many life events and um, the relevance tend to differ from person to person. Um, it's very difficult what we have found to make agencies take responsibilities outside their own area of responsibilities. They won't just do it. So it means that one agency or a new type of agency needs to be set up to coordinate all other agencies that are involved in the life event. So it takes a lot of investment in order to get one of these services up and running. There are very high demands for technical integration and the standards for sharing information between large number of agencies. So it puts a lot of emphasis on horizontal integration to get the life event service up and running. Yeah, one thing that uh, has proven to be difficult, but also is important for an effective electronic or digital handling of um, services is that we don't have breaches, manual breaches. And two points <clears throat> where we found that there are many breaches is in the actual, when you inform the citizen about the decision then you have a manual mailbox outside your house. You have to convert the digital case into a analog case on paper. Uh, so uh, today we have uh, citizen mailboxes, electronic mailboxes. For example, when I have filed for my tax return and I get the receipt, I get it to my digital uh, mailbox. Uh, it has only 4 million users today. Uh, you would expect to have at least 8 million users of this, but it's not taking up that super fast. People tend to mix up with an ordinary mailbox for email, but here you cannot answer, you cannot send from this one. You can only receive. So people tend to think that it's not that much use. But I think it's pretty convenient. I don't get mails anymore from, from different government agencies. I get it into this mailbox instead. So I don't get paper post, I, I get electronic mail instead. Yeah. On the other hand, 
end, we have the archiving. And an archive in, for example, a municipality could be pretty huge. Uh, with a lot of deck documents stretching hundreds of years back in time. And the uptake of digital archiving is pretty slow. But at the end of the day, when you move uh, the electronic cases you have in your back office system into the archive, uh, it's very convenient if it's digital, of course. Uh, and it, it becomes more safe as well. It cannot catch fire in the same sense. It will not be flooded, whatever happens to, to paper archives. Recently, open data has become pretty uh, popular. The idea is that government agencies, municipalities make their archives open. And here already you can see the benefit of a digital archive but they make the registries open um, <clears throat> uh, for um, third parties to build services on. Here is one example. Um, it's called the Reseledare, and it's a service created by a private company based on public open data uh, <clears throat> to help people with autism, for example, HD, ADHD uh, symptoms to navigate in the public transport system. Uh, so it's an app that could be used both on a smartphone and on a smartwatch uh, <clears throat> that help you to, to navigate. One important piece of data that they needed was the exact geographical points for the entrances to the subway stations. As it turned out, the position of the subway systems, uh, the center of the platforms uh, were known in the public registry, but not the entrance positions. So at first they only got, uh, when you walked and followed the instructions, you would end up somewhere in the middle of the street because it was right under your feet was the, the, the subway platform. But what you really wanted was the um, position of the entrances, of course. So, so this uh, is an example where public data, what is needed and what is available could differ a little bit. And here is the team that developed this app and subsequently then started a company. Uh, and they participated in a number of innovation um, contests where they raised money by winning these contests and finally were able to establish their firm. And now they operate this, uh, this service as a company. Here is an example of uh, the open data available uh, from the city of Stockholm. Um, there are many different types of data, annual financial reports, building permits, and also the registry of giant oak trees, for example. So there are a lot of public data with a various degree of importance for third party service developers. Different formats makes it sometimes very difficult to use. You have to convert between different formats. But as we get more and more used to open data, I think the formats will converge. <clears throat> there is a directive about public sector information in the European Union, uh, which stipulates that much of the public sector information should be available for reuse. And they believe that this is a multi-billion dollar or multi-billion euro uh, business that is uh, uh, possible to create based on the proper use of these open data. Yeah. My time is running out, so I will just mention that uh, we can think about 
open data as an ecosystem. And this is how you can create value from open data involving different types of actors. Um, you have the raw data providers and then you have different types of developers here and end users. There are challenges with open data. The initial idea was publish and they will come, but it's not that easy. Developers' data needs are sometimes different from the available data that is published. Also, public agencies become data providers, which is a new role that they have not taken before. They need to handle requests for data from developers and they need to process large volumes of data sometimes. For example, uh, the Swedish Weather Service, uh, <clears throat> they are only the 10th largest user of their own data, which means that they need to create um, a service capacity that is well beyond their own needs. And who is gonna pay for this and so forth. And also in Sweden, the current laws are uh, written and created based on paper and not on digital data, which creates uncertainty. Do we need to collect a signature or not? For example. Yeah, there is a recent trend where we tend to implement more and more software robots in public administration. It's often called robotic process automation. Uh, and it imitates its software programs. We call them robots. Um, it imitates, they imitate human behavior. Uh, and they perform tasks on the user interface of the available systems, primarily back office systems. <clears throat> They're pretty fast to implement. Um, they are very time and cost effective. Uh, they are user-driven rather than IT department-driven. Uh, and it's, it's a simple form of artificial intelligence that also could be <clears throat> a platform for more advanced implementation of uh, artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, uh, <clears throat> video processing, and so forth. We made a survey this spring and it seems like about 20% of Swedish local governments and regions have implemented at least one software robot in their uh, administration. About 50% plan to implement. And it looks like uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, the municipalities are a little bit more positive than the regions at the moment. Third, about one third uh, has no plan, but it doesn't mean that they have a plan not to implement RPA, although some have it, but some just haven't uh, dealt with the issue yet. Uh, the goals here uh, is to free up time for the civil servants and reduce cost of case management, but uh, also to increase citizen service and increase legal certainty in case handling. Using robots, you will always treat the case in the same fashion. And through the robots, you can also implement regulations. However, it can go wrong, like in this case in Gothenburg, where they use a robot and an algorithm to plan um, uh, to do... Uh, yeah. <clears throat> children's placement in schools, 12,000 children, and they used the linear distance for planning rather than travel distance. So uh, it was heavily criticized. Um, children that used to have a five minute walk, they could end up having 45 minutes travel by bus instead. Yeah. Hence the, um, yeah, the title of, of the page here, children are not birds. They are physically attached to earth. <clears throat> so 
this leads to the very end of my presentation. I know I have run out of time, uh, so I will run over another five minutes here. But I will talk a little bit about how do we govern um, e-government development in Sweden? What are the different strategies and action plans that uh, <coughs> government is using to lead uh, e-government implementation here? <coughs> This is a very uh, complex picture, but at the left hand side, you have the four levels of government. You have national, regional, and local, and the supranational European Union. Uh, Europe has two very influential uh, documents and strategies the Digital Agenda for Europe and Digital Single Market Strategy. And you can uh, get them through these addresses later on when I will share my slides. Sweden has a national digitalization strategy. <clears throat> it's one in a row. The first one was published in the 90s. It was called the 24-hour 24 24 hour authority. And the current strategy is called the digitalization strategy. They have also set up an agency for digital government, which uh, is called DIG. And it's also one in a row of different agencies that has been put in place by national government. A national government cannot control exactly what is done at regional and local level. They can only influence because of the Local Government Act from 91, which stipulates that the local government has a large authority of its own business. It also means that they need to develop their own e-government plans and strategies and implement their own systems. However, they um, collaborate in an organization called the Swedish Association of Local Authorities and Regions, and they have their own strategy for development in the digital age. There is also a voluntary organization called the ESAM, um, and SAM is collaborate in Swedish, so the E collaboration. And they have frameworks, guidelines, tools, standards, and examples that they share among each other, and it's open for anyone, so you can see the address here as well, the esamverka.se. And a few snapshots. The national digitalization strategy currently has five focus areas. Competence, safety, innovation, leadership, and infrastructure. It's in Swedish, but you can read and translate. It translates very well over to English if you use Google Translate, for example. The agency I mentioned for digital government, they focus on a few things accessibility to increase inclusion because we're lagging there the minorities and their languages are not represented very well in the public services the digital services that is so they are working heavily with solutions to this uh, they are also focusing on the digital mailbox or the digital post digital identity as i mentioned but that seems to um yeah become solved by itself because it's an interaction between commercial needs and, and public needs. It's only the elderly that are lagging there at the moment. And also solution for invoicing and e-commerce in public organizations since they buy uh, a lot of services and channel that on to citizens. And then we have this collaboration between local and regional government, the Swedish Association for Local Authorities and Regions. Uh, they have their own strategy. It has four pillars, management and governance and organization of digital transformation, the architecture and security issues related to technical issues, information supply and digital infrastructure, digital archives here, for example, and also a cohesive digital service. Um, that is no manual breaches in the digital services. And each area is of course broken down in more details. 
And here is the architecture and security area. There are three goals and you can see here uh, um, some examples here, a common framework, um, systematic security work, open international standards and so forth. In this link, you can download this strategy. It's in Sweden, but as I said, it's easy to translate at least into English using Google Translate. It comes out 95% okay. However, there are a lot of weaknesses in Sweden's digitalization. And as I mentioned earlier, there is a high degree of decentralization in Swedish government which means that every local and regional government have to reinvent the wheel. And it leads to slow implementation and the lack of use of standards. There is a dependency on outdated legacy systems. The first uh, computer systems appeared in Sweden in the 50s and 60s. 60s. And uh, there were some public registries for social security number, for example very, very early on. Uh, and we still live with these old registries and systems and databases. And they, um, they are a good resource, but sometimes they are very old and hinder and becomes a barrier to digitalization. There are still many contact points. Uh, some local governments have implemented a single point of contact but there are still many contact points for most complex life events. And there are still many digital flows that are inco incohesive. There are many manual breaches in the digital flows, for example, uh, due to the lack of digital archiving, but also lack of standards. And the Swedish National Auditing Office they have issued a number of investigations and reports pointing to these uh, weaknesses. So future strategies will take these things into account in, in a better fashion we can have. And also the elderly are quite slow in adoption, which is uh, a threat to the inclusive aspects of, of public um, uh, digital government. So, thank you. That will be the end of my formal lecture. So let's move on to questions and answers.